when I read uh, David Schindler's translation, a book title by a famous Southern author came to my mind. A good translation is hard to find. <laughs> and, uh, I was mightily impressed by that translation because I read the Homo abuses with fear and trembling before I had my first meeting with Hans, with Ulrich Ferdinand, many years ago. Uh, I wasn't even Catholic yet at that time. Uh, that's the first warning. I've come, a, I've come a long way. The second warning is my wife uh, at our wedding gave me a book. It had the title, Germans, People Without Humor. <laughs> uh, this was the first and only joke of this lecture. Uh, <laughs> We are now proceeding to a standard German lecture of <laughs> about two hours. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers of this symposium for the invitation to share some initial thoughts and observations about the newly and masterfully translated Opus Magnum of the German philosopher Ferdinand Ulrich. I was asked to speak about grace and nature and Ferdinand Ulrich's thought. Since this could easily be the topic of a doctoral dissertation, I shall focus in the following exclusively on the homo abusus. The fact that a theologian has been asked to address in the major work of a noted philosopher, albeit an expressly Christian, indeed Catholic philosopher, what is a profoundly and indeed extensively and controversially discussed topic in Catholic theology, is a delicate assignment, to say the least. There are two rather obvious speculative temptations a theologian might succumb to when faced with the task of interpreting the homo abusus. The first is to read the homo abusus as a strictly and exclusively philosophical work and therefore mistake its theological dimension for an idiosyncratic characteristic extrinsic to the book's philosophical inquiry. By succumbing to this temptation, the theologian would put the homo abusus on the proverbial Procrustean bed of a conventional modern understanding of philosophy as a decidedly atheological discourse consigned to what Charles Taylor felicitously called the imminent frame. This Procrustean bed would cut off all limbs that have what looks like a theological provenance. These limbs are to be severed, lest the theological excess compromise what might be taken for the integrity of the proper philosophical argument. This would be one way to butcher the homo abusus. Quite obviously, in light of his opus magnum, Ulrich must be appreciated as a Christian philosopher all the way down. He takes the philosophical act to be an existential act that for the Catholic who is philosophizing is rooted in grace and takes place in the horizon of revelation and faith. While Ulrich rejects a certain theologizing of metaphysics, we already heard about that, what he calls pseudo-theology, his own philosophizing is clearly open to be enlightened by revelation and thereby to receive assistance from above in order to identify and overcome those fateful speculative temptations and avoid those debilitating speculative mistakes that due to the precarious state of the human intellect tend to arise especially at the very beginning of the philosophical act itself. In his early De Ente et Essentia on being and essence, Thomas Aquinas famously quotes Aristotle's observation from the first book of his On the Heavens and the Earth that, quote, a small mistake in the beginning is a big one in the end, unquote. To receive from Revelation insights that can be recuperated by philosophical reflection and that can help avoid speculative mistakes is not only legitimate, but also an authentic trait of the intellectual virtue of wisdom. The other contrary temptation to which the theologian might succumb is to mistake the homo abusus as a straightforward contribution to Catholic theology, a theology of creation, 
crowned by a Christian anthropology. Mistaking the work for a daring exercise of speculative theology, burdened by a somewhat obscure philosophical jargon and excessive philosophical complexifications, would mean to force the Homo abusus into just another Procrustean bed. What would get lost this way is the central fact that the formal object of Ulrich's work is the one characteristic of Thomist metaphysics, esse, the act of being. What is indeed unique about Ulrich's work and what gives rise to the temptation to force the homo abusus into this or the other Procrustean bed is that the book is indeed a veritable metaphysics of esse in the movement, which is not a motus we have learned, in the movement of its finitization that is of creation, a metaphysics of the ongoingly primordial gift of being crowned by what one might best call a meta-anthropology a metaphysical inquiry that is intrinsically open to and that unfolds within the horizon of revelation. To avoid succumbing to either temptation and to let Ulrich's homo abusus be what it is, means for the theologian to receive the theological insights that shine forth in this work of Christian philosophy, indeed as genuine theological insights afforded by revelation, but distinctly informed by what Ulrich takes to be the formal object of metaphysics, the act of being as a. Hence, the way to avoid the two temptations is to consider nature and grace simply by way of allowing the unfolding speculative discourse of the homo abusus to take the lead. Due to the constraints characteristic of a symposium, this manuductio, has to take an extremely contracted form that will comprise three consecutive steps. The first will be a brief explication of the central intuition of the homo abusus, a highly condensed expression that Ulrich finds in Thomas Aquinas and that encapsulates the crisis of being in its movement of finitization. Being denotes something complete and simple, yet non-subsistent. This is metaphysics of repetition, Wiederholung. We are coming back to the central <laughs> intuition for another time, and this might not be the last time for today. And so it's going to slowly sink in. Uh, so bear, bear, be patient and bear with me during this Wiederholung in the first part of my paper. In the second step, I shall turn to Ulrich's understanding of being human as the concretely subsisting focal point of the entire scope of being's movement of finitization, and in a third and final step, I shall reflect upon Ulrich's pivotal principle that grace arrives along the path of being as the key for understanding the relationship of nature and grace in the homo abusus. Let us take the first step by turning our attention to the central metaphysical intuition at the heart of the homo abusus. The central intuition, and indeed the productive and programmatic principle of the homo abusus as a whole, is an exceedingly pregnant insight from Thomas Aquinas' De Potentia Dei, the disputed questions on the power of God, question 1, article 1. Esse significat aliquid completum et simplex et non subsistens. Being denotes something complete and simple, yet non subsistent. Esse, the act of being, actus ascendi, that every being participates in, is the free beginning of the absolute in the finite. In order to appreciate this core intuition at the heart of the homo abusus, it is imperative to attain at least an initial apprehension of the two complementary aspects of esse. The first aspect is that the act of being that every substantial being participates in does not subsist as something in itself distinct from the substantial being. If as a word to subsist as something in itself, it would of course be just another being, ens, with its own limiting essence. Importantly, esse is not a mere concept for Ulrich, which one might come to think of it due to its non-subsistence. For the act of being is present as the actuating power in every being. Thomas Aquinas calls esse, therefore, the actuality of all acts, actualitas omnium actuum, that's also from De Potentia, question 7, article 2, that does not subsist on its own, but rather inheres in all things. 
Ulrich puts it thus, quote, being, esse, itself, is always already itself in the multiplicity of beings, which are at play with each other in mutual givenness because of the unique, unifying, groundless ground of being. I don't even try to give you the German for that. <laughs> Unquote. In sum, esse is poured out into all things without withholding anything for itself. Ulrich states that esse, quote, does not secure itself preemptively in a unity that floats above beings. Being as being is super essential and cannot be substantialized. Hence, the more we conceive being as, a, as fullness given away, the more its non-subsistence comes to light, unquote. So much for the actus ascendis aspect of non-subsistence. Let us now turn to the actus ascendis other aspect, its being complete and simple. Esse signifies something complete because it contains all things. Apart from non-being, nothing is outside of the act of being. And finally, esse signifies something simple that is non-composite because it is the unified outpouring by which God creates all things. Esse is the absolute and pure mediation of being to all beings. Esse does not vacillate as a quasi-entity between God and beings. Rather, Esse is a radical mediation. Therefore, in itself, Esse is nothing. Ulrich calls this nothing that Esse is in itself and of itself the crisis of being. Importantly, creation does not come about by, so to speak, leaping over this crisis of being. Rather, creation precisely occurs by way of the crisis of being. Ulrich interprets this crisis of being, this complete passing of esse into beings, this movement of finitization, as a nihilation. That is, as a passing from ontological fullness, completum et simplex, to a state of always already having given itself away, non-subsistence. In short, he interprets this as an ex inanitio. And read in the horizon of Revelation, ex inanitio is the seal of divine love. Because there cannot be a proper creation ex nihilo, without the outpouring of esse from the infinite subsistent act of being itself, God, into its finitization as substantial beings, Creation is the first divine gift act, an absolutely gratuitous ontological ex inanitio, and as such, God's first and fundamental act of love ad extra. Because creation is an absolutely free, gratuitous divine act ad extra that includes in itself the whole creation as a subsistent relation to God, there must be what Ulrich calls a unique, unifying, groundless ground of creation, a single emanation of the whole act of being as a commune. This free emanation qua divine act, this first esse, must be in a certain way the first of created things, utterly simple, that is non-composite. Ulrich relies here again on Thomas Aquinas, who states, quote, this is Ulrich's translation, first esse is, so to speak, the principle of all others, since it includes in advance in itself all things. And esse itself includes in itself in advance all things that follow from it, unquote. The emanation of the whole act of being is complete and simple and thus includes in itself all things, yet does not subsist on its own, but inheres in all, substantial, excuse me, in all substantial beings. Precisely because of its characteristics as complete and simple, identity with God, yet non-subsistent, difference from God, Ulrich understands esse commune as a similitude of divine goodness. 
the divine goodness is reflected in the actus essendis radical gift character, the generosity of its unrestrained, always already givenness, as well as its constantly ongoing giving, terminating the movement of SS finitization as substantial beings, creatures. The similitude is free, that is, it is intentional, willed by God as the primordial ontological ex in initio, the first and fundamental expression of divine love at extra. While essay is a similitude of divine goodness, the non-subsistence of essay also makes very clear that the essay common to all beings, essay commune, is emphatically not God. Essay commune, while created first, is nothing in itself, it does not subsist, as the highest likeness of God, esse, is infinite actuality in non-subsistence and therefore relies on essence in order to subsist as finite beings. Ulrich's strong emphasis on the non-subsistence of esse allows him to show how essence is really different from esse, yet how essence belongs at the same time totally to esse because essence proceeds from the totality of the act of being. Nota bene, the real distinction between esse and essentia is enfolded in the metaphysically prior ontological difference between ipsum esse subsistence, the non-subsistent act of being, and substantial beings. The divine decision, the expression of divine love to give esse for the sake of the concrete subsistence of beings, the tota substantia re, the ends, is the goal of the act of creation. Let us always remember that. That explains how essence proceeds from the totality of esse and therefore belongs to esse, and yet at the same time it is different from esse. Ulrich puts it thus, quote, the essence proceeds from being because being is fullness, completum et simplex, and because there can be nothing external to it other than non-being. Essence is posited as really distinct from being, however, because being as completum et simplex does not subsist, but is mediated to subsistence in and through and with the essence." Unquote. In short, Esse and Essentia are co-created by God. It is in virtue of the essence that the ends receives its Esse, and that Esse is contracted and limited. Because of the act of being, because the act of being continues to be in act in all substantial beings, they are not without activity operatio. Rather, each substantial being acts according to its nature and therefore perfects itself. This is true also in a very special way for human beings. Even more so, one might say, because human beings have to use their freedom to become who they are. We have reached now the second step, Ulrich's understanding of being human as the concretely subsisting focal point, as he puts it, of the entire scope of being's movement of finitization. Esse is the free beginning of the absolute in the finite. Human beings are challenged to receive this beginning in their own existence as rational creatures and to perform it in freedom as the very realization of their own nature. The free reception of being as the loving response to the love of God, that is Esse, unlocks in human existence the profound truth and meaning of the act of being as complete and simple but non-subsistent. Realizing this truth in one's own existence is not some marginal contingent human achievement. On the contrary, Ulrich states, quote, it is the essence of man to have appropriated being's movement of finitization as the original task of his existence. Hence, 
History occurs through man's enactment of himself in the undergoing of self finitizing being as love. Unquote. It is for this very reason, then, that the human being is what Ulrich calls, quote, the plumb line of being's movement of finitization because he, the human being, encompasses through his essence all the enabling dimensions that lie within the spectrum of ontological participation, unquote. And precisely because of this, fact that the human being is the concretely subsisting focal point of the entire scope of being's movement of finitization. It is that the human being opens up the entire dimension of ontological participation into the ground of the ontological difference of being from beings. And then I end the quote here from, from Ulrich. This is why his essence consists in the undergoing of this difference. Human beings have to receive their being in freedom in order to become fully human in act. And by doing so, they confirm or consent to the divinely willed character of essay as truly given. The condition for the possibility for human beings to receive their being in freedom is the difference and therefore also relationship between person and nature that shines forth in the human soul, the anima intellectiva. Ulrich, quote, it is the soul itself as the concretely existing focal point of the ontological difference in which the relationship between person and nature comes to light. The entire quality of the soul's existence stands and falls with a yes or no to beings ex inanitio. Man himself is the task, Aufgabe, of obedience to being in concrete subsistence, unquote. The consent to and the affirmation of the gift of being mark the crucial difference for Ulrich between the good under a certain respect, bonum secundum quid, and the good absolutely considered, bonum simpliciter. Every being in this world is good insofar, secundum quid, it is a creature of God. Yet only the free response to the communication of being, essay, is the good absolutely considered, bonum simpliciter, at which this communication of essay aims. The difference between the good absolutely considered, bonum simpliciter, and the good under a certain respect, bonum secundum quid, leaves open the room for evil in this world without revoking the goodness of creation, precisely because this difference gives to all rational creatures, angels and humans, the possibility to be free agents, that means free moral agents. Remember, as Augustine and Aquinas have pointed out, even the devil is good insofar as he exists, insofar secundum quid, as he is a creature of God. Yet he is the first creature that refused to consent to and affirm the divinely willed character of Esse, as truly given into the finitization down to the very poverty of matter, and thus failed to realize in his own existence through his free act of consent the bonum simpliciter. Now the human being has to face the same temptation. Ulrich states, quote, as embodied spirit, the human person stands in the same temptation as the angel, to sacrifice the super-essentiality of to be, the ex inanitio, to pseudo-subsistence and to surrender the poverty in spirit to the pseudo-wealth of substantialized being." Unquote. This great temptation is embedded in the very fact that the human person is the creature whose essence consists in finitude, a fact of which the human being is always implicitly aware. Ulrich explains, and I think I'm also repeating a quote here, we didn't coordinate our papers. <laughs> Ulrich explains, quote, the more originally we experience the transnihilation of Esse in the causal act of being, then since the causal act intends 
the race subsistence, the more originally we become aware of the uncaused character of being qua being as the character of the always already given reality, as the world which is always already there. This unique character of the being of the world have enclosure in itself from which the hidden God has apparently withdrawn himself. The world that always presents itself to all of our questioning as a world that persists in self-sameness. The world that engulfs all the bridges to the infinite that we erect in an attempt to bring God closer to us. That is to capture him as a piece of the world. It is this world precisely in its tempting man to alienate himself from God because of its apparent absoluteness that reveals the depths of the uncaused character of being qua being. This character is the ultimate seal of God's creative, loving intimacy. End quote. Because of this apparent self-withdrawal of God from the world, indeed the seeming eclipse of God, quote, the crisis of being can be successfully undergone only on the basis of the revelation of the triune God, which is received in faith, unquote. And then Ulrich states pointedly as a follow-up to that, the Logos says incarnation reveals the transnihilation that pierces pseudo-subsisting being and the redemption of man from imprisonment in the ontological hypostasis of the anti-God. Consequently, the closure to the supernatural dimension of God's revelation that has come to pass in history leads inescapably to a substantializing of being insofar as its super-essentiality is always already sealed in the ex inanitio into the positively subsisting race, unquote. In the light of revelation, the human person is able to reject this fundamental temptation and thus realize the fundamental act of human existence as gratitude. Quote, it is the thinking as thanking, which represents the original operation of the intellectus apprehensivus entis, the intellect apprehensive of being that makes the human being what he or she is, thinking as thinking. We have reached the point to take our third and final step to reflect now in light of this on the relationship of grace and nature, um, in light of beings ex in anitio, and in light of Ulrich's pivotal principle that grace arrives along the path of being. One central, impl one central implication of the transnihilation of esse, completum et simplex and non subsistence, is that already nature arrives along the path of being. Because the goal of the movement of the finitization of being are substantial beings each specified by its proper nature, nature is first and foremost a necessary entailment of the goal of the movement of finitization itself. All substantial beings have a specific nature according to which the substance communicates itself in its accidents and according to which the substantial being operates. Hence, nature is a necessary entailment of the gift of being that is love. What is crucial about the human being among all material beings is the nature-person difference. As an individual substance of a rational nature, that is as a person, the human being is able to relate freely to his or her nature as the creaturely gift it is, as the absolute gratuity of divine love it is, and realize through reason in freedom the teleological thrust of his or her nature toward the full flourishing characteristic of the human being as embodied spirit in the world. Only as person can the human being realize that his or her specific nature is Gabe, gift, and precisely therefore also Aufgabe, task. 
human nature, however, in the extant order of providence, as disclosed in the horizon of revelation, is wounded. The result of the aboriginal rejection of the primordial giver in the primordial gift, thereby forfeiting the union of the love of friendship, charity, with the primordial giver, the origin of all things. While only revelation can point out this aboriginal betrayal of divine love and its consequence, a human nature estranged from its origin God, philosophical speculation receives constant intimations of the profound woundedness of human nature and hence also of human reason by way of the recurring speculative temptations to which reason tends to succumb and by way of the frequent speculative errances into which reason falls. <coughs> Only in the light of revelation can the speculative vulnerability of philosophy to these manifold speculative temptations and errances be clearly discerned and only in the light of revelation can it be fully understood why it is impossible, actually, for the human being to inhabit the ontological difference without constantly being tempted, on the one hand, to identify God and world and thereby quasi-deify the cosmos, or on the other hand, to eclipse God and therefore to quasi-decreate the world and the human person and thus reduce them to mere positivistic, positivistic facticity in short, the perennial temptations of pantheism and materialism. The other central implications of the transnihilation of esse, completum et simplex, as non-subsistence, is that not only nature, but also grace arrives along the path of being. What does this mean? The movement of finitization into being has as its most prominent theme, first and foremost, the gift of existence to human beings. Crucially, this gift is recap recapitulated in Christ. The Son of Man, in the hypostatic union, the highest form of grace, enacts humanity's natural reason and thereby recapitulates and fulfills humanity's fundamental calling to be subsistent gratitude. Christ, according to Ulrich, is the definitive revelation and the absolute fulfillment of humanity's task of obedience in concrete subsistence to the necessary sense of being, beings ex inanitio. Furthermore, arriving on the path of being, grace undergoes the ex inanitio characteristic of esse. Grace is wealth and poverty, fullness and nothing in one. First and foremost, in the incarnation of the Logos and his ex inanitio, down to Christ's passion and death on the cross of Golgotha. Second, as healing and restoring grace, grace gives itself completely and without remainder to the goal of its finitization, the healed and restored human person. Because grace is infused into the rational soul, the anima intellectiva, it is the human person that in the ontological order is healed, restored, and elevated first, and it is human nature that is healed, restored, and elevated in the ontological order subs subsequently, while simultaneously in the chronological order. The key to this ordering is given in the incarnation of Christ. Ulrich states, quote, this is where the profound sentence from Aquinas belongs, which casts a new light on why, on what we have just elaborated. Christ first repairs what regards the person and afterwards will simultaneously repair what pertains to the nature in all men." Unquote. Because of the non-symmetrical reciprocal causality between person and nature, the human person healed by grace is now sustained by the redeemed teleology of his nature. Third, every motion of operative grace that gives itself completely to human freedom has as its goal the free cooperation of the human person with and in grace, to love God freely and thereby have thinking, 
restored as thinking. The relationship between creation and salvation is disclosed by revelation to be one of perfect fittingness. Note well, the ontological difference between esse and ends is not closed and replaced by grace. Rather, according to Ulrich, the ontological difference is confirmed by grace and in virtue of grace reveals a depth unknown before revelation. Quote, the history of being, that is the ontological difference that is to be undergone anew at every moment, and salvation history are inseparably interwoven into one another, unquote. Note well, they are not identical, not in a seamless continuity, but distinct, yet inseparably interwoven. In sum, grace arrives along the path of being means that grace follows the movement of finitization. Healing and restoring grace subsists as the human person healed by grace and thus restored to God and sustained by the restored transfinality of human nature. Such a person lives the little way of love, realizes his essence or her essence most fully in freedom as imitator of Christ, becomes Christ-like in his ex inanitio, receiving through death life and in the nothing of the complete self-gift in love, everything. The goal of healing and restoring grace is the full human imitation of God's goodness through self-giving love. There my lecture would end if it were not a dialogue with Ferdinand Ulrich. I know Ferdinand will invite dialogue and now his Thomistic other is engaging him for only a short second. So no cause for panic. <laughs> only a few minutes because I want to now turn to an aspect of grace that is not as prominent, I think, in his work, but in the, in the fullness of the development of grace. Grace is not just healing and restoring, but grace is sanctifying. And the goal of the sanctification is deification. And I'm for a moment reflecting on that in a dialogical mode. Uh, and I'm sure Bishop Oster will report that to Bernard <laughs> um, uh, for a moment on that. So the, all, the one all-important dimension of grace, beyond its healing and restoring aspect that remains to be considered last, is the elevation of human nature and the beginning of deification, the inchoate union of the human person with God in the infused theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. Healing and restoring grace aims at the redeemed person imitating God's self-gift in love. Sanctifying grace, the ontological reality of grace that confers deformity on human nature and its faculties, by contrast, aims at the formal participation in God, the ipsum esse subsistence. The movement of finitization, the gratuity of God's first gift, is the condition for the possibility of the return of the human person to and formal union with God, deification, the second surpassing gratuity of God's love as predilection. As stated earlier, nature is an entailment of the movement of the finitization of esse, the goal of which are subsistent beings. Healing and restoring grace also arrives along the path of being and participates in beings ex inanitio. Yet as sanctifying, as the beginning of deification, grace is the beginning of a new immanence of God in his human creature and thereby the beginning of the return, the reditus, not reditus to oneself, but reditus to the Father, of the human person, to its origin, the absolutely gratuitous supernatural telos of which is the beatific vision. This reditus is characterized by its own, albeit now inverted, unity of wealth in poverty, of an already and not yet. While the already is accentuated in hope and charity, the not yet is accentuated in faith. Yet even in the epistemic poverty of faiths not yet, 
there already lies hidden the substance in embryo of the things hoped for. Now I take the liberty to quote from another friend of Ferdinand Ulrich. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI expresses in this theological, tr this theological truth in a manner that is as clear as it is beautiful in his encyclical letter Spe Salvi. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the proof of things not seen. St. Thomas Aquinas, using the terminology of the philosophical tradition to which he belonged, explains it as follows. Faith is a habitus, that is a stable disposition of the spirit, through which eternal life takes root in us and reason is led to consent to, watch, to what it does not see. The concept of substance is therefore modified in the sense that through faith, in a tentative way, or as we might say in embryo, and thus according to the substance, there are already present in us the things that are hoped for, the whole true life. And precisely because the thing itself is already present, this presence of what is to come also creates certainty. The thing which must come is not yet visible in the external world, it does not appear, but because of the fact that as an initial and dynamic reality, we carry it within us, a certain perception of it has even now come into existence. Space Alvi, paragraph 7. This is the wealth hidden in the poverty of faith. Charity, on the other hand, already unites the wayfarer formally with the divine nature itself, whose essence is love, a love that subsists personally as the Holy Spirit. Yet the wealth realized already in the union of charity, that is friendship with God, remains to be realized in the very poverty of faiths not yet. Presently, in via, the wayfarer's union of charity with God is not yet a union of sight and knowledge, hence marked by a distinct poverty. Only in the beatific vision, the union extends to the human intellect. By way of a created light, the lumen gloria, the intellect receives the ipsum esse subsistence as its own form. In the formal union of knowledge and love between the Deus abusus and the Homo abusus, the difference between infinite and finite, uncreated and created, is maintained, understood, affirmed, and praised as the final doubly gratuitous state of the divine love ad extra. The Homo abusus, the lost son, has returned forever from the far country to the Father's house, so that now, in the eternal praise of the heavenly liturgy, deep calls to deep, abusus abusum invocat. I thank you for your patience.